Hi, and welcome to Ones and Twos, FP's economics podcast. Every week we take a couple of data points, we use them to try to explain the world. I'm Cameron Abadi, FP's deputy editor with you in Berlin, Germany. As always, Adam Twos, FP's economics columnist and Columbia University professor, is with us this week in Korea. Hi, Adam. Hi, Cam. So, in the second half of the show, we're going to be talking about artificial intelligence, some new advancements in that technology and the effects that might have on the labor force. But first, we're going to be talking about the economy of Qatar. Not coincidentally, that is the host of the ongoing World Cup. Adam, have you been watching any soccer? I have, yes. Yeah, I do. I'm, I'm one of those occasional soccer watchers. <laughs> well, yeah. I'm... I think it's basically a kind of European cultural thing. You can't you can't really not. So, um, yeah, I have. Yeah, I watch with my six-year-old son. He knows a lot more than I do already as a sort of European. But in any case, yes, we will turn to the economy of the host country, Qatar. Our data point is two. That is Qatar's ranking in terms of the world's natural gas exporters. It's the richest country per capita in the world. So where does it get all its money? Oil and gas, the cornerstones of Qatar's economy. Being oil, natural gas, and from sectors adjacent to those, such as petrochemicals and fertilizers. Gas accounts for about 70% of Qatar's government revenue, 60% of its gross domestic product, 85% of its export earnings. It's at the center of its economy, clearly, although this week Qatar is at the center of the global conversation because of the World Cup. But still, we wanted to kind of zoom out a bit and look at its broader economic situation while all eyes are on it. So, Adam, yeah, I just read out all those statistics about Qatar and gas. It got me wondering, what did the Qatari economy look like before the country discovered its gas deposits? And that also got me wondering, when it found gas, how did it even sort of make the transition to being this kind of gas power? Are are there like consultants out there that come in and sweep in when you find gas to assist, you know, in the acquisition of all the expertise you need on this kind of thing? Yeah, well, I mean, to speak historically of the Qatari economy is is a little question begging. I mean, after all, what we're talking about is an emirate, which is 160 kilometers long and, you know, 90 kilometers across at its widest point. It's basically a peninsula that extends out you know, from Saudi Arabia into the Persian Gulf. And um, it's been ruled by the Al Thani family since 1872 and was originally under a British protectorate. And in 1900, um, you know, had a population of 27,000. That's 1% of its current population, of which a substantial fraction were African slaves, um, because this is classic slaving territory. Um, It it was an economy that lived off, you know, insofar as one can speak of an economy, it it lived off fishing and pearl diving. And by the 1920s, it was in dire straits because pearls were out of fashion and were being replaced by artificial (laughs) pearls. And so really, you know, they were in serious trouble. Um, Your short answer is obviously a community like that is not well equipped to discover, you know, major fossil fuel reserves. And and they didn't. Um, Mm. As as it was was true across the across the region. Of course, the locals were aware of the fact that there were you know black oily deposits visible in many places and strange emissions of gas, but but had no way really of conceiving of those like the rest of the world as well as you know major natural resources. And and the people who do are of course the imperial powers and the imperial powers backed up by the what will become the major oil companies of the world. And so from the 20s onwards, the entire region is a field basically for um, competition between um, the, the the major oil companies of the world. And it's not gas, but oil that's first found in, in Qatar in, in 1939. And it's, a, you know, as you, as you'd expect, it's a combination of, you know, British, imperial, New Zealanders, American oil geologists who were rivaling each other to find oil in in Saudi Arabia famously of course but also in Bahrain and then they they see analogous geologies because oil science at the time is pretty rudimentary they but they see analogous geologies in Qatar and then begin exploring that and so it's in 1939 that they they first strike oil um it's worth saying and it's important to say i think that that you can't do this kind of imperial surveying without local expertise there are always um, locals that need to take you to the obvious geological features because you don't know what you don't know. And there are no maps of these places until you make the map. And so how do you start making the map? 
And it, in, in Qatar's case, it was Sheikh Mansour, who was a, a local savant, if you like, uh, uh, in geology, who attached himself to the Western geological teams. And through to his, um, bli he became blind in the 1940s due to trachoma. Um, but he was a constant uh, accompaniment, a guide uh, to all of the oil geology teams that that struck um, oil in in Qatar throughout the 1930s and the 1940s. So it's this blend of, as it were, local guiding expertise and local knowledge with outside expertise. Um, so it's a Anglo-Persian um, Iraq syndicate group that um, finds the oil initially. And then finally begins extracting it in 1949. It was Shell that found offshore oil in the 1950s. And then it was Shell also in 1971 that found the giant North Field, the giant, the world's largest offshore, the world's largest gas field. And that happened at the same time as a, as a palace coup within the Altani family. And so a new regime took charge. It didn't immediately develop gas um, because oil was the big thing. So Qatar was basically a minor oil producer and doing very well, nice, doing very nicely doing that during the 1970s. But the money was frittered away. And in the 1980s, the Saudis decide to crash the oil price. So it's really from 1989 onwards that gas begins to be developed as a unique Qatari asset. And and really, after another palace coup in 1995, these are all bloodless. It basically huh. involves the senior figure of the family being in Switzerland or, you know, falcon hunting in Saudi Arabia. And then at home, everything gets rearranged. In 1995, really, is when the big uh, L LPG, crucially orientated Qatari development kicks off in earnest. So it's really between the 80s and the 90s that Qatar becomes what we know it as today, namely a gas superpower. And that's also when you see Qatari GDP surging from that moment onwards. Got it. You make it seem like, yeah, for a long time, the Western geologists and oil companies were the real sovereign actors and the locals were just assisting them. Maybe, yeah, we should return maybe to that oil economy history at some point. But Qatar also has one of the world's highest rates of migrant labor these days. As you mentioned, it's a small country not that many citizens relative to the workers who come from abroad. So what sort of economic privileges do Qatari citizens enjoy these days relative to their migrant laborers? Yeah, I mean, we've heard a lot, of absolutely uh, justifiably in the context of World Cup coverage about migrant workers um, in, in Qatar and that and the sometimes really appalling conditions under which they work. The Qatari regime has made efforts to improve those under the scrutiny of outside observers, but it still remains an incredibly unequal system uh, and one which makes no bones about it. And, and Qatari's uh, uh, citizens are some of the luckiest people alive. I mean, they are born into a system which guarantees mm. tax-free income, high-paying government jobs, free healthcare, free higher education, financial support for newlyweds, housing support, uh, free utility bills or, or massive subsidies for them. There is an entire website designed for nothing other than sluicing suitably qualified Qataris into jobs in the private and public sector. There is a Qatarization program, which makes no bones about the fact that the aim of the game is precisely, and for good reason, to overcome, as it were, the, the structural historical legacy of a situation in which um, the natural resources of Qatar are largely developed by, by, by foreign uh, labor and by foreign companies, and uh, up until the 1970s at least, also for the benefit, of course, of foreign investors. And so that is indeed the, the system, um, a, a hugely proactive system. It affects maybe 10% of the populations, right? So the citizens mm. of Qatar amount to about 300,000 people out of an overall population. The figures are extraordinarily variable of about somewhere between 2.5 and 2.9 million inhabitants of Qatar. So one-tenth are Qatari citizens. And this means that there is a really a sort of four-tiered labor system um, in Qatar. Um, there is, as it were, the ruling family, the, the true elite of Qatari society. Um, then there are regular Qatari citizens who are marked by, above all, by clothing, right? By, by the wearing of, of the gown and headgear that marks ordinary Qataris off from the foreign workforce who generally do not adopt that kind of clothing. Then you have the elite Western workers 
uh, overwhelmingly Western, recruited from all over the world, but uh, who who themselves enjoy an extraordinary range of privileges, not quite at the same level and with the same citizenship rights as Qataris, but also very low tax regime, subsidized housing, subsidized education. And then at the bottom of the pile, the overwhelming majority of people living in Qatar and servicing its economy are, of course, migrant workers, uh, and above all, from within the Indian Ocean. Um, and, and it's worth saying, to avoid the use of sloppy language, that there is actual slavery, too, in the Gulf regions, in, in say, Saudi Arabia. That, that you could say there's a fifth tier of workers who are literally bought and sold various types of indentured labor along, in many cases, the old routes of uh, black slavery um, uh, involving in Saudi Arabia, according to the estimates of some charities, 50 to 60,000 people. Um, in Qatar, it's not thought there's more than about 4,000 people who are in that status. So foreign labor is not slave labor in that sense. And, and given the fact that there is actual slavery, it's, I think, important to make that distinction. Uh, but they obviously live in in, in hugely discriminated uh, circumstances in, in foreign labor camps. And these are workers, it's important to say, above all, from, from South Asia. So across the Indian Ocean, which is a short hop, if you're in, in Qatar, uh, it's Ka Pakistanis, Indians, Nepalis um, who come to the Gulf um, for, for work. Yeah, given the fact that 90%, as you said, 90% of the population is comprised of foreigners, it got me wondering whether, yeah, these migrant laborers are also performing core functions of the state, you know, whether security or administration or bureaucracy, some of these sort of functions that we think of as usually performed by citizens. Is this a kind of unique experiment in Qatar when it comes to those sort of core functions of government being performed by foreigners? And, and yeah, does that make the country less stable in some way? It's true across the Gulf, and and it's worth saying that the tentacles of that kind of pattern of the employment of foreign expertise by Gulf states go very deep, very wide, and they extend to folks like myself. So I've taught at NYU Abu Dhabi, which is a fully funded private university, cosmopolitan, uh, funded by the, the by the Emirates. Um, I've attended events, say, of Davos, the WEF, which are also uh, on the Emirates dime. And I actually did uh, a couple of sessions of consulting for the Qatari Delivery Authority for the World Cup, um, which were looking for geopolitical advice in the context of 2020. Um, and you're dealing there with, you know, extremely well-briefed Qatari principles and then a staff of civil servants who have recruited from all over the world. Um, and that pattern is completely normal in these states. You know, it's easy to think of it as kind of mercenary in some sense. Um, and, and that's not a, I think, false analogy. Um, and it creates, you know, a variety of different um, sort of conflicts in a sense, uh, but also advantages. Because one of the things that this means is that you don't get the buildup in many of the Gulf states of civil society in the form that we understand it, right? You don't get the uppity lawyers, the difficult uh, uh, journalists, um, that is contained by the fact that the vast majority of the people in those kind of positions don't have citizenship rights. So from the point of mm. view of the stability of the regime, it actually has an upside. You might say they're less loyal, but they're also more disposable. This is part of the mercenary model. And we should take the mercenary analogy seriously because it's really in the military that this is most pronounced. So it's estimated that about 85% of the soldiers in the Qatari military are uh, foreign nationals. Above all, again, don't be thinking Western mercenaries, though there are some, some Colombians there now, but it is above all Pakistanis, Sudanese um, that serve in the rank and file. And at the other end, then, you have a tradition of military advisors, so-called, going back to British imperial days, where you have the Qatari or other Gulf state officer corps who are trained at Sandhurst or West Point or you know naval academies in the United States, and then have very close relationships with Western advisors who are either still on the payroll and in the uniform of the US or the British military or furloughed out. And uh, that builds these incredibly close connections, which then, of course, pay off in the form of the giant American base in Qatar, uh, but also in arms contracts, because if you get your advice from the Americans, of course, you also tend to buy your weapons from them. Qatar is also one of the centers of Islamic finance. I, I was curious if you could yeah, explain what Islamic finance is and how exactly it works, what distinguishes it from yeah, the sort of financial system that we're accustomed to in the West. Well, Islamic finance in its modern form originates in the 1960s, came out of Egypt, along with much of the revival of modern Islamic thinking. Um, 
and has developed since into a fairly substantial branch of global finance. And what it is addressed to is how you square modern financial practice with two Quranic injunctions. One is against usury, and the other is against dealings on ambiguous or potentially deceptive bases. So Islamic law, in this sense, codifies common sense objections to finance. So, you know, many people object to what people think of as the profoundly asymmetric relationships between creditors and debtors, which is, you know, encapsulated in the the fact that you pay interest to borrow money that you don't have for a project you need the money for. And and many people, I think, are profoundly discomforted by thinking about things like derivatives contracts, for instance, which are, you know, money, vast amounts of money changing hands on the basis of bets about counterfactuals and hypotheticals. And Islamic law takes those two sort of instincts, if you like, those intuitions seriously and says, you know, this is these are things we should avoid. And so it's a system of finance, quite large scale finance. It, you know, the Islamic banking assets worldwide run to about $2 trillion plus. So depending on how you count it, that's somewhere between 3 and 6% of global banking assets, depending on how you value those, which are structured around credit relationships that don't involve interest. So the, 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 the obvious way of doing this is simply various types of share participation, where rather than making a loan, a bank takes a stake, and then the person receiving the money from the bank has the option of buying the bank out progressively. Like it's essentially an equity stake type model. So these are somewhat contorted constructions. But the the fact of the fact that this contains lever, limits leverage means that this is a in some senses like the fantasy banking system of the most radical critics of Western finance who would indeed try and move away from loan-based finance and would prefer it to take the form of equity stakes and are profoundly skeptical about different types of derivative contract. And Qatar has indeed emerged as a, as a major center. Got it. Finally, Adam, how might climate change affect Qatar? I mean, is it even going to be possible to live there in a world that's several degrees hotter? Does it have an economic model in a world where gas has been replaced by renewable energy in much of the world? I mean, you raise a really crucial issue, I think, here. I mean, on the one hand, um, you know, the Middle East may be viewed quite reasonably as the premier producer of fossil fuels, but it's also absolutely the crosshairs of climate change itself, because the entire region is already um, extraordinarily difficult to inhabit because of the extreme heat. And this isn't just the Western perception. Locals feel it very acutely as well, and their elite leaves the region as far as they possibly can during the the, the worst seasons. And it isn't simply heat, it's humidity as well, which is a real killer in the region at the wrong time of year. And humidity is the thing which our bodies find it hardest to deal with because we can't, you know, in dry heat, you can sweat away the heat. In humidity, you can't. So that's the real risk. Uh, and they know that they're at risk from it. And of course, the simple answer is that if you're as rich as Qatar or the Gulf states or Saudi Arabia, then, you know, you can make the world inhabitable by means of highly sophisticated forms of cooling system, which we have seen on display during the World Cup. The the mortality risk in the Gulf is more in much poorer Middle Eastern states like Iraq, for instance, which does not have the resources to properly cool tens of millions of people um, in extreme heat situations. And then as we move across the uh, Indian Ocean to Pakistan and, and northern India, which is where it's going to get very, very difficult indeed. Um, but for cooling, what you need is energy. And of course, Qatar, like the other Gulf states, has energy in vast abundance. I mean, take your pick, oil, gas, um, solar, wind, they can do all four. Uh, they're also interested in building nuclear capacity. They are going to be energy superpowers. They fancy themselves as major hubs also for hydrogen production, because the crucial thing you need for hydrogen is abundant energy. Um, and the way they understand their situation is that there is no future without them because there is no plausible energy transition scenario over the next half century, shall we say, the, you know, the only kind of time frames within which it's reasonable to plan, in which there is not still some substantial consumption of oil and gas around the world for hard to abate sectors and for economies which are still developing. And the offset will be various types of carbon capture. And the countries that will supply that oil and gas in these conventional scenarios of energy transition are the lowest cost producers. And the lowest cost producer for oil is Saudi Arabia, and the lowest cost producer for gas is Qatar. And so 
they don't their vision of energy transition doesn't involve one in which they stop making oil and gas um, because there will be a residual need and and they will be the lowest cost producers. Um, the future is bleak, on the other hand, for the high cost producers of oil and gas. Right, so that's how they see a future developing. They see themselves as as energy hubs with huge climatic issues, which they have to adjust to through adaptation. But in terms of the production of energy, they see themselves as key producers uh, for the foreseeable future. Got it. We will keep an eye on it. We do need to take a break here, and we will be back in a second to talk about artificial intelligence. Hi, and welcome back. Our next data point is four. That's a reference to the fourth generation of the generative pre-trained transformer, or GPT, that was just released by the company OpenAI. It's being hailed as a revolutionary advance in artificial intelligence. The system is designed to provide information and answer questions through a conversational interface. Basically, you can just kind of type in a question and it'll provide an answer any kinds of questions in fact a new online chatbot is making waves on social media for both its precise and also painfully <laughs> honest answers for years people have been saying robots might be able to pack boxes but they will never be able to write a poem like human beings well it turns out your shitty poetry has some competition the artificial intelligence is trained on this huge sample of text taken from the internet it was designed for ease of use and it turns out to work out that way and it yeah, responds in all sorts of formats, whether you want informal chat or a dialogue, or you can even ask it to write you an essay or a play, and it will perform that in any style you request. So this has raised new questions about artificial intelligence and its relationship to labor market. Suddenly, it seems like the technology might, might not just be coming for manufacturing jobs or jobs like truck driving that have been discussed in the past, but professional work, uh, maybe even the kinds of journalism that we do at FP, or I don't know, the kinds of scholarship maybe even produced at places like Columbia. So Adam, I wanted to ask about your perspective as a professor, first off, specifically the part of the job that consists in teaching. Uh, a lot of people are talking about how this uh, artificial intelligence can produce essays based on prompts that a professor or teacher might provide, and that professors may not be able to tell the difference. So you tell us, how do you go about grading any particular student's paper or exam? I mean, do you think you'd be able to spot an AI-generated text? And do you think it matters whether whether you could or not? I mean, I'm really not sure, to be honest, whether I would be able to. I mean, the rate at which this is developing, um, it's going to be quite difficult to answer that question with confidence because it does imply having a strong model of you know, your own process in, in grading. And I think anyone who honestly looks at that process and their procedures for doing it will admit that uh, you know, it's a fuzzy business at best, and my ability to, you know, identify a um, student one way or the other would be quite. I mean, I don't know. I, I feel, I feel not altogether confident about that. I mean, the sad thing may be that the easiest way to spot the fact that an essay was done by AI will be that it's too clean and too grammatical and doesn't contain, <laughs> you know, typos and so on. And so, it, it, I think it would become truly foolproof as a mode of cheating if if they could train the AI to be less perfect. I mean, certainly when you're, you know, we already have an issue with plagiarism or, you know, just basically copy and paste essays where people take chunks of text from the internet. And, you know, and anyone who does research knows that there's this risk of simply copy and pasting material that you find online into your own prose and then forgetting where you got it from. And the easiest way certainly to spot that is when a student's prose suddenly smooths out and it sounds as though you're reading like an adult professional writer and you realize that's clearly not the voice of the person that you taught or wrote the rest of the essay. I mean, more seriously, I think, you know, this question of whether it should matter. I mean, what is it we're, what is it, what is it we, we're testing for? And I think, you know, if chess is kind of an interesting example, because that's one of the zones of human endeavor where AI has made most progress. And it's literally the case now that it's not so much, well, the, the best chess players are benchmarked against their ability to, through human cognition, produce the same sequence of moves that the very best AI programs would make. 
So in a sense, you know, the, the situation for our poor students might very well be that in due course, AI defines what it means to write a good essay, you know, at least at some basic technical level. And, and we ask them to match that. Where I think AI really has huge upsides, and you see it already with students, is in fact more on the teaching side, less the examining side. Because, you know, anyone who's done routine teaching knows that in fact the problems that students have are predictable. And that's what AI does sophisticated AI done is is predicting engines and you give them a problem you know about say the French Revolution or whatever in history and you get the students to answer a bunch of questions and a good AI program could probably figure out what they do and they don't understand and where they need to be helped it could make suggestions as to are you sure you understand you know Robespierre and what Robespierre was really about or do you really you know from what you've just told me I get a sense that you don't really quite understand the nature of the tax revolt in 1789 do you think we ought to have a tutorial about that and so let's go over that material again yeah I mean as you're pointing out artificial intelligence works on the basis of noticing patterns or learning patterns and then applying them and yeah I guess that got me wondering how much of human behavior is following the sorts of patterns that algorithms could emulate. I mean, you know, we're used to thinking of rote work as, as pattern-based, but does the same go for much of what we would think of as thought-based work? I mean, is genuine human thought less common than we think in many jobs? We end up here in some real struggle, don't we, over defining what we think the genuine human is. And, you know, we end up defining routine and imitation as not really being human, um, which mm. I, th I think probably takes us in the wrong direction. Because on the contrary, it seems like imitative behavior is, in fact, quite fundamental to who we are. And it's clearly true that, as it were, the logic of systematization and disciplining and routinization that you might think of as being applied to the mechanical actions, um, you know, disciplining just literally bodily behavior on a factory production line or, or you know, in military drill or, or sp in sport, for instance, where you're training people to, to, you know, kick a ball in a certain way or whatever, that, that we think of that as qualitatively distinctive and different from mental activity. And that, that, doesn't, that doesn't make sense, right? Because in fact, when you were teaching people to think hard, you're actually also teaching a kind of, you're actually also teaching a kind of discipline I mean, one way one way I was thinking about this was you, know, you take something like classical music performance, um, where there is a score. You know, there's the music that was written by Mozart or Beethoven or whatever, and you can absolutely mechanically, using literally physics, describe the physical quality of a performance and its conformity to the music as written, and you must do that in a sense, right? And deviation from that is is basically you failing to perform the music. If you play a note too long or too slow, you know, or too short, or the sequence of, of of notes does not flow as smoothly as it should, then you are not playing the music correctly. And then, but on top of that, there is also this dimension of interpretation, which has a different feel to it. It's a different quality of appropriation, a different quality of performance that distinguishes something that's technically correct from something that's artistically convincing or novel or just simply beautiful. And you could, of course, if you think hard about that, that too is trained. I mean, that's what, that's what musical tuition, that's why ensembles rehearse over and over again, that's why they discuss but I think maybe the difference is that it is, you know, inspired by sensibilities that are very hard to formalize, then discursively embedded in conversations amongst people that say, yes, we're going to do it this way. And in retrospect, we might be able to codify it such that, you know, the most brilliant performance of a, one of Beethoven's late string quartets or whatever would become analytically open to us. And we could then begin to train an AI program to produce a particular type of performance, not just to be technically correct, but to actually even grasp some of the musicality that enters in. You, know, you could train AI, presumably, to be genuinely funky. Like that's, a, you know, it's challenging to do because it's really difficult to actually capture in a score what makes up the incredibly subtle movements of a, you know, an amazing bassist or whatever. You know, if we put our minds to it, we could probably formalize even that, but it may just not be worth it. Well, to get back to some of the labor 
issues here. I mean, if this replacement of labor by machines were to arrive, would it be a social utopia or a dystopia? Because it seems that economists have been sort of speculating on this moment for a long time, but they don't necessarily agree on what it would mean. On, on one hand, from what I know, Karl Marx predicted, say, that there would be a, a crisis with a miserated proletariat that would be unable to find gainful employment anymore. But on the other hand, there are economists like Keynes who kind of painted a vision of a productive society that just worked less and had more time for leisure. So do one of these scenarios strike you as more plausible than the other? You know, the straightforward answer to that is to say it's all about politics. It's all about power, right? That's the fundamental issue here. The technology itself has potential for good and for bad. And the question really is how it's deployed. And you know, the likelihood of it having utopian consequences all by itself. I think that's the naivety, right? If you take a society riven by conflict and riven by huge inequality and inject technology into it, the technology by itself is not going to save you from the sort of society that you're in. Um, it could ameliorate around the edges. It could make the situation even worse, but it isn't by itself going to produce a utopian radical transformation. It could open the door to struggles which could make the world better. It could empower groups of people, for instance, that previously were not empowered and give them more leverage than they previously had. You know, one of the, you know, the fantasies of tech enthusiasts, at least back to the 1970s, has been that the the masters of the code, the masters of the software universe will at some point rise up as the the new, you know, progressive elite that will put the world to rights. That seems naive, but is it true that our dependence on software does give power to the coders? And that's clearly true. And we may be, you know, about to see a demonstration of this in a situation like Twitter, where you have an empowered oligarch taking over a company, mistreating the workforce. And if enough of them quit, then the platform may just simply collapse. And the people who use the technology may simply walk away from it. Um, so technology, by producing change, may open up the possibility for struggles of various types that will empower certain groups at the same time as they disempower others. Having said that, again, looking out at South Korea as I am here, I mean, it's hard to deny the transformative and to a degree liberatory impact of technology per se, right? As much as I want to be a socio and economic relativist and say it's really all down to social structure, the fact of the matter is, is that we're recording this podcast with me here, you in Berlin, our producer Laura in Israel, <laughs> and it's going perfectly smoothly. And I'm looking out on a, you know, a brilliantly lit, happy soul night in a country which 60 years ago was desperately poor. I mean, truly desperately poor. And part of what enabled this country to grow is not simply, you know, the power of the Korean elite and the coercive mobilization of the Korean military in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, but also the human capacities unlocked in the Korean population by an investment in education and their enthusiastic embrace of, you know, everything from original, you know, 1970s and 80s electronics to the current digital age. And there is a degree, you know, there is a story of peasants into netizens in that kind of history, which can't, which doesn't just reduce to, to power and economics. So tempered optimism, but no utopianism. Yeah, I guess, I guess finally, I wanted to ask a bit more about this reciprocal effect that AI could have on the kind of work that we do. I mean, I'm thinking here of the AI-powered image generators that are out there as well that recently have been released that are also remarkable in their own way. You know, when the production of artistic images is automized, I just imagine that must have some influence on the production of art itself, that artists will incorporate that knowledge of that automization into their own continued production that, I don't know, the terms of aesthetics will shift as a result as well. And maybe, I don't know, could the same be true of text and, and writing? Although I guess I'm not sure what exactly that would mean. Maybe the, yeah, the aesthetics of writing would change when so much is 
automized. But what do you think, Adam? Yeah, I mean, I have a brilliant journalist friend who's really confronted me with this question. And her line is always right. You know, valuable writing now is writing that you don't think could plausibly have been generated by AI. And the same criterion applies in an art museum. Hmm. You know, the, the art that's worth going to a museum to see is the stuff that you can't really plausibly imagine having been produced by AI. That, I think, is the kind of confrontational position, right? That wants to define art almost in the manner of a kind of, I don't say this as a criticism, but like to locate that. I think that idea is a kind of romantic conception of sub, of, of creativity. Um, or at least it goes back to that era where you see people like Immanuel Kant as well, struggling with what distinguishes judgment and aesthetic judgment from the mechanical operation in some sense of logic, right? And sort of naturalistic determinisms of various types, which is essentially what the AI spits out. I think you could also imagine a more creative interaction. I mean, again, to come back to chess, because it's one of the realms in the world which have been completely transformed by AI, no serious chess player any longer trains without playing the machine, right? It's through playing the machine that you really are able to explore all the possibilities that are open to you at any given moment. And then performance in the game is judged by your conformity to you know, a path that would have been tracked by that machine. And the machine itself, once upon a time, would have been thought of as the product of the accumulated genius of you know, um, global chess playing. Now we have to confront the fact that, yes, many of the latest programs have learnt to play chess and then you know, with astonishing speed taught themselves to be champion-level Go players um, by playing themselves. So at that point, I think the position is one of kind of humility almost. And it's tempting to say that the last reserve really of human creation in that sense will be a kind of in like i started by joking about student essays that you know we can tell they're not ai generated because they're full of typos well it, it may be in a sense that and this i think is a rather defensive description of how we could end up but that the zone of human creativity is the zone of craft of things which are clearly handmade they you, you can tell they're handmade by their imperfections right and and it'll be in the slightly DIY quality of a certain sort of culture that we will recognize that it doesn't belong. It's not the result of a machine production process. I will say here that there are, in doing my research for this, I came across podcasts that are entirely generated by artificial intelligence. It's both written and performed and recorded entirely autonomously. And they were not terribly pleasurable to listen to, but maybe that'll be on its way. Maybe we'll be replaced. But then they're going to go to a different area. So Joe Weisenthal did an experiment, you know, from Bloomberg, and he did an experiment where he got a chatbot to give him like a standard <laughs> macroeconomics assessment of the world right now, and it's 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 horrifyingly oh, good. Boy. I mean, it really is like a parodic kind of rendition of what <laughs> of what your average talking head. And of course, it's a little bit too close to the bone but for me right now. <laughs> It's not all that comfortable to hear. Uh -oh. it's, Wait for the it's twos like, bot out it's, there. Uh, it's, it's like, you know, it's three updates away from being able to just render you completely redundant. And it does raise this issue of what would be your unique selling point? What would be the, what would be the, the twist that you could add? Well, we do need to leave it there for now. Uh, I will assure our audience we are, we are flesh and blood, not robots yet. <laughs> Ones and Twos is written and edited by me, Cameron Abadi, along with Adam Twos. It is produced by Laura Rossbrow Tellum and Rob Sachs. Our social media manager is Claudia Tady. The executive editor of FP Podcasts is Dan Efron. This show is made possible through the support of foreign policy readers. If you're interested not just in Adam Twos, but news and analysis from around the world, consider subscribing. Ones and Twos listeners even get a 15% discount. Just go to foreignpolicy.com slash subscribe and use the promo code Twos at checkout. That is T-O-O-Z-E. And listeners, as always, we love hearing your feedback. You can send us voice messages on the Ones and Twos homepage on foreignpolicy.com, or you can email us, podcasts at foreignpolicy.com, or tweet us, that's at Ones and Twos Pod. Thanks very much for listening, and we will see you back in your feed next week.